One-hit wonders. First of all, I want to say my name is Bob Grove. I do preach here occasionally in Pastor Steve's absence. I'm glad to step in here while he's attending to uh, memorialize uh, one of his uh, close friends. One Hit Wonders is a new series. It's going to la- go the rest of the summer. And it's about people, artists who had one song that got really popular and you never hear from them again. So I graduated from high school in the 70s, and the number one song in the 70s was Spirit in the Sky. The Spirit in the Sky. How many of you are humble enough to say you remember that? Thank you. Thank you. Honest. We're at church. You've got to be honest, right? And that was performed by. Now, I'm surprised that someone remembers that. You know all the trivia because that's the only thing he did. It was immensely popular, became a movie song in a couple of movies, and he was never heard from again until the sermon. So our series about, is about one-hit wonders in the Bible, short books, and people who pop up just once. And today, the Old Testament story is about Obadiah. Obadiah is a prophecy against the now defunct nation of Edom. I could tell you the background. Instead, I found an excellent video from the Bible Project that explains the content in the background of this book. So let's look at this video. The book of the prophet Obadiah. This is the shortest book in the whole Old Testament. It's a mere 21 verses. And at first glance, it does not look very promising. It's a series of divine judgment poems against the ancient people of Edom, which was a nation that neighbored Israel on the other side of the Dead Sea. However, there is way, way more going on here. So first, here's the backstory. The people of Edom were unique because they had a shared ancestry with the Israelites. They both belonged to the family of Abraham, who with Sarah had their son Isaac, who with his wife Rebecca had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now the book of Genesis told us the story of these two brothers, and to say the very least, they had a tense relationship. They each later received the names Israel and Edom, which eventually became the name of the families that descended from them. And these families replayed the same difficult relationship of their ancestors. Israel and Edom had enormous tensions throughout the centuries, but they still shared that family bond. And it's that bond that was betrayed and shattered in the tragic events of Jerusalem's fall to Babylon. So when Israel was invaded and conquered by Babylon, the people of Edom took advantage by plundering other Israelite cities and then capturing and even killing Israelite refugees. Now in other prophetic books, God held Israel's neighbors accountable for this kind of violence. And so here, Obadiah does the same for Edom. The short book has two halves. The first part is a series of accusations against the leaders of Edom, specifically for their pride and self-exaltation. Literally, as they lived up high in the desert rocks, but also metaphorically, they truly believed they were superior to the Israelites. And it's that pride that led the Edomites to not just stand idly by when Babylon came to destroy Jerusalem, but actually to participate in the destruction. And so God says through Obadiah that Edom will be brought down from their height and destroyed. As they have done to Israel, so it will be done to them. Now right when you think you're going to hear more about how Edom will meet its doom, the topic suddenly shifts in verse 15. We hear this, the day of the Lord is near against all nations. Now why do we all of a sudden shift from Edom now to all nations? This first is a hinge piece and it links the first half of the book to the second half where Obadiah announces the day of the Lord but not only for Edom, he widens his focus to include all nations. And Obadiah says that all prideful nations that act like Edom will face God's justice in the same way. They'll fall from their prideful heights and come to ruin. Now the combination of these two sections, one about Edom, the other about all nations, shows us why Obadiah was so interested in this tiny southern neighbor of Israel. Obadiah sees Edom's pride and fall as an example, an image, of how God will one day confront the pride of all nations and bring about their fall too. It's hardly coincidental that in Hebrew the word Edom, or Edom, is spelled with the exact same letters as the word humanity, or in Hebrew, Adam. In Obadiah, Edom's rise and fall is a parable of how God's justice will one day oppose pride and violence among all nations in the day of the Lord. 
But as in all the prophets, God's judgment is never his final word. Specifically, remember the conclusion of the two books that came right before Obadiah, Joel and Amos. Joel had painted a picture of what will happen after the day of the Lord against all nations. He said that God would perform a new act of salvation in Jerusalem and that all who humbled themselves and called upon him would be delivered. And in the conclusion of Amos, he said that after the day of the Lord has judged Israel's evil, God would raise up the house of David and build a new kingdom for Israel that would include Edom and all the nations called by my name. And so the book of Obadiah has been placed right after Joel and then Amos to expand on these very promises about the hope of God's kingdom over all of the nations. And so the book concludes with a very hopeful future. God says he's going to restore his kingdom over the new Jerusalem, that he'll repopulate it with a faithful remnant. And then from there, God's kingdom will expand to include all the territory and nations around Israel. And so this little book contributes to the larger portrait of God's justice and faithfulness that we're seeing in the prophets. The ancient pride and betrayal of the people of Edom becomes an example of the greater human condition, all of the ways that we betray and hurt each other and God's good world. But there's hope, Obadiah says. Edom's downfall points to the day when God will deal with evil in our world, but also bring his healing kingdom of peace over all the nations. And that's what the book of Obadiah is all about. Yeah, thank you all for bearing with that. I thought it was a great video in the introduction. So we come to the point now, how do you make an application for that type of a book? Well, we could dismiss this book with the thought, we know God hates bad countries, let's call it quits and go outside and eat tacos. But what is inescapable is that just like Edom, we all struggle with pride. We all struggle with it. And it's, I think it's very possible to read this book and to say, wow, I do see some of myself in Edom. James 1.22, is, the reference is going to be up here, maybe not the scripture, but it talks about how we should approach the Word of God. It's not just an academic uh, a thing when you go to gain information. It's not just a spiritual exercise where you get a spiritual boost out of it. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word because that would be deceiving yourself. Do what it says. So I want to approach the book of Isaiah from that perspective. How do we do what Obadiah says? Well, here are some lessons that I learned from Obadiah. The first one is this, I will freely admit my pride First lesson, I will freely admit my pride. Now, let's be honest. We are all susceptible to pride. We are all prone to forget that we are sinners saved by grace. And we're often guilty of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And I think we can better understand the pride within by reading stories of pride like this one from Obadiah. So let's read from Obadiah, verse 1. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, rise, let us go to battle. That's not a good thing when the Lord says that. Verse 2, see, I will make you, Edom, I will make you small among the nations, and you will be utterly despised. And here's why, verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, make your home on the heights. You who say to yourselves, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? Oh, yes. And if the grape pickers came to you, would they leave not just a few grapes? They're going to leave you nothing. But how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Friends will deceive and overpower you. And those who eat, a bread, eat your bread will set a trap for you. You will not detect it. Your friends are going to turn on you. Verse 8, in that day declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom of understanding in the mountains of Esau? You warriors, Teman, will be terrified. Everyone on Esau's mountain will be cut down in the slaughter. Wow. I think God was pretty upset with Edom. You know, of all the evil things that Edom did, and idolatry is at the top of the list, 
That's usually what the Old Testament prophets condemn the other countries for, is their idolatry. Idolatry is not mentioned here. What triggered God's wrath was pride. The Titanic is one of the most well-known examples of pride for me. The engineers of the Titanic touted the ship as being unsinkable. Therefore, they designed it with not enough lifeboats. They ignored the iceberg warnings and plowed through dangerous seas. They went full steam ahead because, for their own ego, they were trying to set a speed record for the transatlantic cruise. The crew was so taken by the hype that when they were given the evacuation orders, they did not do them immediately. So on the maiden voyage of the Titanic, April 12, 1914, it hit an iceberg and went down. There were approximately 2,224 passengers on board. Only 706 survived. Over 1,500 died. Why? Because of pride. Because of pride, the ship was ruined, and all those who went along for the ride were devastated, and most of them died. And I looked at that, and I thought, how much is this like a prideful person? Someone who declares that they have no flaws, and they build their plans, and they live an overinflated view of themselves, and they end up shipwrecking their own lives and hurting those around them. Pride. What does pride look like? Proud looks like the spouse who just can't admit that they are wrong. Don't elbow your spouse. That would be wrong in church. Pride is a friend who refuses to apologize even though they hurt you and they know it. Pride is the braggart who ruins his friend group because all he talks about is himself and the group falls apart. Pride is the opportunist who sees no fault in his investment plan and then promptly loses his friend's money. Pride is the workmate who thinks that they know everything and they're glad to tell you it. They're glad to push their opinion on you. Pride is the relative who's always criticizing someone else as if they themselves have no flaws and can do no wrong. Pride is that person who always uses themselves as the example of what is good, good and right and true. Pride. So the first lesson from Obadiah is that pride is like a lightning rod. It draws God's attention and not in a good way. And God is very good at humbling proud people. So how do we apply a story about judgment on a now defunct nation? Well, we personalize it and say, I will, I will admit my pride. Second lesson I learned from Isaiah is this. I will intervene when I see injustice. Edom had the opportunity to step in and defend their neighbor Israel. If not just for the practical reasons that if Babylon destroyed my neighbor, they might destroy me, which by the way, they did. What about the humanitarian perspective? If Israel was being pummeled, would you not want to come to the defense of your neighbor? Read verse 10 with me. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. And I love the wording in verse 11 because it shows a posturing. On the day you stood aloof. You just stand there and watch like it really didn't matter to you. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem you were like one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in the calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of trouble." Not only were they guilty of standing by, standing aloof, they were guilty of rejoicing. And not only were they guilty of rejoicing, they were guilty of participating in it. And God indicted them because they stood back and did not intervene. I spent a lot of time in my life trying to apply God's word to myself as a pastor. I was a full-time pastor for quite a few years. 
And I thought if I could travel in time and go back to certain eras, what would I have done as a pastor then? What would I have done or said about slavery if I was a pastor in those days? Would I say anything? Would I justify not doing anything? Or would I be like the majority who said they aren't even people? What's the big deal? What if I was a pastor in the period of our country when the Native Americans were being slaughtered? Would I have done anything? Would I have said anything? Or would I have been like the majority of the pastors who said, those are savages. They're just pagans. What about if I was a pastor during the time of the brutality of the KKK? Would I speak up to the risk of my own life? And is the time coming in America where pastors are going to be forced to make choices like Dietrich Bonhoeffer did in Germany when he opposed Hitler and his regime? This is what it means to apply God's word to yourself. So I thought, you know, what does intervention, what does intervening look like today? Well, it's going to be different for each one of us, but I I think of some examples of people I know. Eric, in our last town, had a full-time job, and he became a CASA. Who knows what a CASA is? court-appointed special advocate. He would volunteer to go in and just stay by the sides of people who were families who were going through issues with children who had been neglected and abused. He would be their advocate. He volunteered for that. I think of Judy, who was on the board of a crisis pregnancy center, and she had been in a crisis pregnancy early in her life, And it's a center that doesn't just tell people that abortion is wrong. They help mothers and fathers. They train them, and they have a pantry to give the needed goods to these young families just to help them choose life. I think of lawyers who do pro bono work for poor people who can't afford to be represented in a court of law. I think of those who report a superior who is unjustly targeting a workmate, I think of kids at school who will turn in a bully who's terrorizing somebody else. What does intervention look like today? Those are things I think about. I think about the called to care ministry that operates out of the uh, basement of our older section of the building here. And if you don't know about called to care, you will by the time I get done. I talked with uh, Sherry Chapman, one of the founders of that, yesterday at the Helmar Palooza. My mom says, what's a Palooza? I said, I have no idea. But she was out there with their booth representing Call to Care because they were selling pork chop on a stick. It was tasty. And I said, how did you get into this? So she told me her story. She uh, is involved, employed in a social work field but that wasn't enough. They brought it home and they began to foster and they began to adopt and they have several adopted kids. I think they're up to seven now. I don't know the exact count. She took it to heart. The mission of Call to Care on their website is, our mission is to mobilize churches and individuals to actively care for children and families in the foster care system. You see, it wasn't enough for her to watch it. It wasn't enough for her to have a job. She had to do something to help those kids be on her job. Call to Care is not just a ministry to families, uh, but to give the church practical ways to get involved with this ministry. The website is wearecalledtocare.com. And you may want to write that down. We are called to care.com. And when you go to the website, it says, you want to get started on this journey? Go and see the movie Sound of Hope. How many of you have seen the movie Sound of Hope? Not enough hands. I'm telling you, people, it is a powerful movie about a a group of people, a church in the 70s in uh, eastern Texas that just got convicted about it, uh, about not convicted. They were convicted to do something. (laughs) 22 families fostered and adopted 77 kids. And they got to the point where in their area, in a certain circumference, there were no kids needing a home. It's a wonderful, inspirational movie. That's what it looks like to intervene. And it's going to look different to everybody. But one of the lessons I learned from Obadiah is this. I will intervene when I see injustice. Third point is, uh, lesson is, I will not exempt myself from God's judgment. 
I'm not going to place myself above God's judgment. Now, in the Bible, there's temporary judgment and there's final judgment. So in temporary judgment, God will temporarily judge and punish a nation, usually with another nation or with a plague or something. Final judgment is when Jesus comes and your destiny is set. You're either going to spend eternity with Jesus or eternity in hell based on your relationship with Christ. That's final judgment. So this scripture talks a little bit about the taste of judgment for Edom and then final judgment. Verse 15, the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns, the day of the Lord is near for all nations, not just Edom. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. When will this happen to Edom? It happened in the same century. Babylon, who wiped out Jerusalem, came back, and King um, Nabadonis conquered Edom. The Edomites who were left gradually got absorbed into the surrounding cultures, and the Nabataeans took their land. By Jesus' time, those who were left of the Edomites were known as Idumeans. You may read that in the New Testament about the region of Idumea. Funny thing is, those who were formerly related to the Israelites actually got integrated into Jewish culture. And the last historical reference to them is in 70 AD by the Jewish history, historian Josephus, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. 20,000 Idumeans uh, were fighting with the Jewish zealots on the losing side against Rome. And they were never heard from again. Those people were gone, gone, gone. And by the way, since then, all the nations that conquered Edom have now themselves been conquered. This was in the prophecy of Daniel. Babylon was conquered by the Medes and Persians, who were conquered by the Greeks, who were conquered by the Romans, who were conquered by ad nauseum. It never ends. And you might be tempted to think, this book is for Edom, not me. But read again in verse 15. It says it is for all nations, and that does include us. I want to give you an example of how we exempt ourselves from judgment, by the way. So that's what the point is. We don't want to exempt ourselves from it. You're going down the highway, minding your own business, going slightly over the speed limit, and a pickup truck will make it a Ford F-250, just for uh, illustration's sake, with huge mag wheels and big old mufflers hanging out the top. <laughs> He's passing you up. He steps on the gas, sprays you with carbon, and just goes flying down the road. You're thinking, where's a cop when you need him? A minute later, you see red lights behind you, and you get pulled over for speeding. And you're thinking, hey, there was someone worse than me. That, how come they didn't caught? Why are you picking on me? And you ask the officer, why didn't you get that truck? And they'll say, I caught you. And sometimes we're like that. We think, oh, but there are people much worse than me. Why am I the one getting in trouble with the Lord now? And we do place ourselves above the traffic laws when there are people breaking the laws worse around us, you know, we will all be judged for our sins. We're not exempt because we're saved, and that's another theological discussion. And sometimes to refine us, God may choose to test us by letting our sins destroy us for a little season. On the last day, we will all be judged. But because of Jesus... We who are Christians will be declared not guilty. Not without sin, we'll be declared not guilty. As it says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But be sure of this, we will all be judged for our sins in the final day. So I learned a lesson from Obadiah and say, I will not exempt myself from God's judgment. Last lesson. I will wait patiently for the Lord's deliverance. This is the part that the video talked about where it talked about the restoration of Israel. And if there's one thing that we know about the Lord is that he will never forsake his people. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And even when we displease God, we are his children and he's never done with his children. As it says in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he is faithful because he cannot deny himself. 
Listen to the restoration in verse 17. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance, will be holy. Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be on fire and Joseph a flame and Esau will be stubble. They will set him on fire and destroy him and there will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. Then it talks about how these people are going to possess the land. And in verse 21, it looks ahead to the day of the Messiah. It says, deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. So the restoration of Judah is a big theological explanation. Uh, you know, what happened when they returned under Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, they got to come back from captivity in Babylon and rebuild their nation, but they were never strong again. It's looking ahead to the day of the Messiah, and that's a great discussion. But what I want to do today is I want to touch on the principle of God's restoration for his people. Who here has a surprise lily, also known as a resurrection lily, in their yard? Anybody have those in their yard? Two hands, three, four. Okay, thank you. Now I don't fear near, near as lonely. First service, it was just one person. It's a really funny lily. In the spring, it grows up and has heavy leaves, and it's a very thick presence. Then it dies off during June, and it's gone. Late July or early August, the flowers spring dramatically from the ground. And the really interesting thing is from the time they sprout from the ground to the time they show a flower is about four days maybe five. They spring. That's why they're called surprise lilies. I remember my first experience with a surprise lily. We had just moved into a home in Bluffton, Indiana. Uh, we'd never been homeowners before. First season, I didn't have any time to do any landscaping. My interest in that stuff wasn't as much as it is now. And I saw something grow up. I thought, oh, good, there's a flower there. So I mowed around it and mowed around it, and it died. So I mowed over it. I was very disappointed it was gone. And for weeks, I'd mow over it. There was nothing there. It was, there was nothing there. And, and suddenly, uh, in August, these ghostly, pale little spikes grew up out of the ground. Growing up like snakes, I'm thinking I'm going to mow them off. Oh, wait. That's where the flower was. And within the week, there were beautiful blooms. There were beautiful, fragrant blooms. And as the name suggests, I was surprised Another name given to that is the resurrection lily. I like that because I, maybe another name would be the lily that's called, hey, you thought it was dead, but look, now I'm blooming. That would be a good name for the lily. In your life, you may be waiting right now, stuck in the period in between when the leaves were blooming, when the, I'm sorry, when the leaves were growing, and the flowers have yet to come, and you're standing there in your life looking at bare ground, and you're wondering if your life is ever going to bloom again. You're trying to wait patiently on the Lord, but it's hard. You're trying to hang on to God's hope for restoration, but all you see is bare earth where green leaves once grew. You know, when Obadiah wrote this, the restoration of Israel was decades away. But he was encouraging the people of God to trust in the Lord. That was one of the songs that we sang today. Speaking of songs, this thing here is called a hymnal. Got this at the Historical Society. And I was reminded of a song in here. So if you all will turn to page 430. We'll be sitting on the first, first standing on the second, jumping up and down on the last. Now, those of you who are old, remember how that's how the song work, the li song leaders would do it, right? Let me read you the lyrics of this song and see if you remember this oldie. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There will be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. It was a song and a prayer for people who are in difficult times, just holding on to hope. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers, we plead. There will be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now refreshing 
Come now and honor your word. Some of you are, are in that season of life right now. You're waiting on the Lord. Well, take courage. God is faithful. I think a lot of this depends on going back to the first part of the book, too, about humility. First Peter 5 says, God opposes the proud, but gives favor to the humble. Humble yourselves there for under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. So I learned this lesson from Isaiah. I will wait patiently for the Lord's restoration. Now, friends, that was an awful lot of stuff I gave you today. Good job hanging in there, but let me boil it down to a few things. Here's my exhortations. Live humbly. Act, act compassionately. Revere the Lord and hold on to hope. Live humbly. Act compassionately. Show reverence for the Lord and hold on to hope.